everyone. Welcome to another week of OSHIP. Uh, this week, I've brought in my friend Lance Porgo, who is the EVP of e-commerce growth at the shipyard. Uh, I happen to like Lance a lot. He's a very smart guy, but I can safely say that at least 25% of the reason that I had to invite him on was because he has a company that he's working at called The Shipyard, and everyone knows I like a good old-fashioned nautical theme. Uh, I'm hoping to be on my kind of best form today, and just worth noting, I had my first COVID shot yesterday. I can't actually move my left side of my arm, but I don't seem to have any of the major symptoms. Uh, but uh, we'll see, hopefully, if I make it through the show without uh, stumbling too many times. Uh, but I'm glad I'm feeling good enough that I didn't have to cancel and uh, was able to meet with all of you today. Um, so today's subject is uh, going to be what I think a really interesting one. Uh, Lance uh, is a, you know, a, a advertising marketing guy who's been in the business for a really long time. Um, and he's got some things that he's been writing about recently and with a, a numerous blog posts that I've been reading about kind of challenging some of the biggest rules of marketing. Uh, and I like anyone that's contrarian and willing to, you know, kind of put it out there and challenge kind of traditional thinking. And we're going to get into some of that today, both specifically around one of the big arguments he's been making around uh, basically uh, fighting against this concept of uh, targeting a single audience, but then also talking about maybe all the other ways that you can kind of challenge the status quo of marketing and what's worked and what's not worked or maybe turned into an O-Ship moment. So with that, welcome to another week of O-Ship. Lance, welcome to the show. So glad you're here. Wow, oh, great to great to be here. This is fun. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, Lance, I, I know you well, uh, but our audience doesn't know you. Could you take a, a, a brief in, uh, introduction of yourself, just so we can give everyone some some context around your experience? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I've been in this advertising business for a while, um, I, and uh, but every time I do something new, I try to kind of run a little bit further away from it and try something new. And uh, it always becomes a pivot, if you will. I say I started out in like pretty traditional advertising. Uh, and then I moved to like this other place called Kirsch Bonbon, which was sort of like the anti-ad agency. And uh, like their, their mantra is, I can't believe it's advertising. Like anything that doesn't feel like advertising is better. Uh, and then I met you, uh, Freddie, when I was at Nitro and then Sapien acquired us. Um, and, uh, and that was really very focused on marketing transformation and technology and how to change the change the world through that. And then from there, I went to this, I started a, uh, a marketing futures consultancy uh, called Tomorrow um, with uh, old colleague John Bond. And we uh, we basically were looking at the MarTech industry and what's happening in venture capital and uh, and uh, with with MarTech and figuring out and using that as a way of saying, what's the marketing business gonna look like in the future? Um, and so we worked with, you know, early stage companies and tried to figure out where do we, where do we, where do we, how do we use that to sort of figure out where the future is going and how do we get companies to get to the future um, much faster? So we did some pretty cool stuff. That's when like programmatic moved from like, you know, being remnant and we had the first premium programmatic uh, conference and mm -hmm. bot fraud was rampant and still is. So we kind of blew a lot of stuff up and we were kind of, uh, you know, we challenged agencies, we challenged uh, marketers to do things differently and look at where the future is headed. And then that, and then the shipyard uh, acquired us and they were really cool because we, they are, they're all about creativity and data. So it's kind of everything I've been working on, it sort of comes together and how do those two things, you know, okay. change the where marketing's going. So that's kind of where I've been experimenting with this this thought I've been uh, I've been uh, playing with for a while. It, so we'll when, we, when we first met, uh, I believe it was, I was in New York and we were, I believe, talking about the Mars business. Uh, we also, I think, ran across each other, you know, first on the, on the foot, uh, foot Locker business, which was, was super interesting. Um, back then, I think you, I kind of considered you like the consummate, you know, advertising ad man kind of uh, profile. Do you still consider yourself an advertising guy, or it sounds like you've gone really deep into the kind of like future of marketing space? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think advertising the backdrop, and it's a, and I think it just comes back to how do you tell Chris sharp stories? Um, but you have to apply that to all different things. So I've applied mm -hmm. that to. You know the different marketing problems to different thinking about how you 
uh, think about audience targeting. I mean, you just take the take the discipline of of advertising or marketing, and and how do you actually solve problems? And but it has so much more application. I've used it for change management for companies. Um, so it's just a discipline more than it is you know, the business, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Good, good foundational skill, that's for sure. Uh, and yeah. I have to ask, uh, do you have any idea what the root of the the shipyard or the history of the shipyard name is? I, I'm intrigued. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's just like an O ship, so it fits. Yeah, but yeah it, it's, uh, yeah, the shipyard's like, the, the shipyard is, the, is where the ships park, right? And it's where they kind of come in, they get refueled and they get set up and they get ready to kind of go on their venture. And so we think about our clients as the ships, and we're yeah. the shipyards. They kind of come into our harbor, and uh, we kind of get them set up and and, uh, and geared up for the future. And if they and if they don't do that successfully, then they go to O ship. Yeah, no, that's then they go to your <laughs> show, right? Perfect. Good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad all we're all, circle. all, 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 all <laughs> cyclical. Yeah, good. I, I just want to make sure we're all on the same the same page. So, <laughs> so um, again, a lo- lot of different areas we're going to dive into today. But I, I want I want you to tell the audience about. Um, this kind of big, big rule of marketing that you've been challenging a lot lately in your writings. I know you've been quite prolific about it, but I'd love to, you know, kind of reach, uh, sum it up succinctly, and then we can talk about maybe what some of the implications of what that means. Sure, sure, yeah. So, the, one of the most foundational things in marketing, I think it's, I think it's about a hundred years old now, is this idea of segmentation, right? So, um, so segmentation is taking a target, you know, the full universe of the targeting of, of people you can target and you break it up into segments you know and uh, and that's been around for for quite some time and it's really ingrained in how marketers think who's my target audience how do i how do i understand them deeply and then how do i take do everything that we're doing from product to service to experience to advertising etc how does all that line up and really appeal deeply to that audience um so that's that's sort of the core foundation, and 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 so I've been really thinking about how do you is that is that still valid today in a world where uh, you don't really have to just target a portion of the audience, right? You can target you talk to just about anyone. The internet has changed that completely, and then you know then you get to think about things like you can behaviorally target. You've got data science on your side, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and 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 with all that, you can basically deliver a relevant message to anyone, hundreds of different types of people, multiple segments simultaneously. So if you can target all these different folks, why do you need to worry about just thinking about it as one? And the reality is that one is usually, uh, you know, a bit of an archetype, or uh, you know, it's a generalization or or even the lowest common denominator of what a person is and what's happening with that person in a given moment when they're doing something on the web. So um, usually what happens is it limits, it just limits your universe. So a segmentation study usually has five or six segments in it. And so that means you've got like 15 or 20% of the marketplace is your total opportunity, if you will. And, uh, and they used to say in advertising, you know, you pick a segment because you can't afford to target everyone, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I kind of would flip that and say, you can't afford now not to target everyone because yeah. You know, if you're just starting with a with 15% of the audience, you're you're kind of you're kind of like uh, playing you know playing with one hand tied behind your back at that point. So, so, so I, I, not, sure. I, wrap, I, I, I wrap my head around this because I, I was I've been looking forward to this chat because it is it is you know I mean hell even last week I was you know having chats with people I mean hell I think yesterday I think I was having chats with people about you know, know knowing your audience um, and knowing your target. So is it is it really targeting? you know everyone or is it saying hey look there's a there's a broader there's a broader target range you're still saying hey i, I need people that ha- you know the people that maybe the product or the service solves a particular challenge they have but there could be dozens or hundreds of variations of people that might fit into that and and so so and again i'm just repeating this back to make sure i've really wrapped my head around it so I, I again, I, I can even think of times I've recently said, like, "Hey, look, if you can't you you can't reach all these people, let's go after the segment that that is going to give you the highest ROI." Um, because and you haven't even got enough budget to get all of them, so why why distract yourself and spread yourself out? A big part mm-hmm. of that is all the the work and the labor that goes into doing that, which I want to ask yes. you about in a second. But yes. so, are you yes. suggesting basically that? Um, you could target like do- dozens or potentially hundreds of uh, of these variations, but maybe you're only targeting the most high or ro- likely 
ROI, I'd like you to convert when in each of those segments. So theoretically, the the overall result would be better. Is that is that is that? I want to make sure I'm, yes. I'm getting it. Yeah, yeah, no, without a doubt. And you kind of have yeah. you still think treat audiences differently. They're not all created the same. There's just the mm -hmm. fact of the matter. There's lots of them. There's lots of people that would want to buy your product or participate with your brand. Um, but you know, but so you open up the aperture. But you're still going to focus, you know, a lot of your your activity around the ones that have the highest ROI. But the mm -hmm. but the first step is actually figuring out what the ROI is for all those audiences. So mm -hmm. how do you actually do that? And a lot of times that's happened in a research, you know, study. We we do it in market, so we actually know mm -hmm. for real what the behaviors are and what all those opportunities mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. and how you actually can rank them. Mm -hmm. So you might start by testing all the audiences, um, and then you said, then from that, like, here's, here's let's test every possible audience out there. Let's just mm -hmm. see which ones raise their hand, all right? So then you've got a bunch that raise their hand. They're not all created equal, you're right. But the, you know, and then from there you can say, okay, now let's figure out the most profitable ones. Let's rank all those audiences from top to bottom. And the ones that are at the top are definitely the ones you want to spend the most time on. They're the ones you'll probably create custom content for. You'll be mm -hmm. focused on, you know, a lot of your branding activity and all that stuff will happen. But all those other hand raisers, if you just leave them, you know, to not buy your product, there's probably a really simple thing you've got to do is just be at the right place at the right time and say the right thing. And you can do that very simply, you know, very much with, by machine. You can have a machine program said, whenever this person who's over here, who's not, who's valuable, but not as valuable comes up, make sure you serve them an ad and this is what you say. And mm -hmm. if you do that with by machine and, and you know, you could spend very little amount of money on it, but you can make sure that you're getting that, that audience as well. And there's also ROI positive. Uh, the other ones might be more valuable and you spend more time and more human energy, but, you know, let the machines kind of go after the other ones and get them all. So, so I want to talk through the kind of how of this in, in more detail. So, um, you know, if, if you were looking at this in a kind of a more traditional sense, you would have a whole bunch of these different ads you're running, um, obviously, in, typically in the digital space. Um, there's a bunch of creative that needs to be developed. There's a bunch of company that needs to be developed. There is a whole bunch of, you know, specific little ad groups that you're creating and there's basically a bunch of labor. And so yep. historically, you know, you would have said to, um, you know, the, the marketing department or, or, or anyone you're working on the strategy with, look, you know, we've got a total budget. We don't want to blow all the budget on labor because then we're going to run out of money to do the spend the money in media where we can actually reach our customers. Um, how t talk to me a little bit more around how you actually go set this up? Because I'm hearing you know the machines and the systems and the AI, and you know I, I geek out on this stuff personally, but I really want to make sure other people understand yeah. what does that really mean to go set that up, and how do you do it in a way that is either no more cost and labor than it would have been originally or even better potentially less cost and labor so you can spend even more money on media because that's when that's obviously when you can really make the bucks roll in yeah it's a great question and that's that's kind yeah. of the interesting part is you kind of you can start off doing this at you know at really at test levels with mm -hmm. you know with fairly limited amount of money and, and we test it believe it or not with like banner advertising and mm -hmm. uh and if you if you start with that and think about what's it cost to make a banner ad really it's really simple right and, uh, and, but the reason why we use banner advertising is because everyone ignores them. So if you can actually mm -hmm. get a message through using a banner ad, you know, when we can do this with social too, but it, it's same, mm -hmm. same difference. But if you, you can get, uh, get actually someone to react in that, in that the hardest possible format in marketing, then you've got something. So it's a really stringent test. So what we'll do is we'll say, we'll start off and get it. We'll take a client and we'll say, all right, what are all the possible audiences? Let's get them all. Let's get them all on the table. Let's go through every piece of research. Let's go, let's use everything we've got on the web to play with. And let's find all the possible audiences that are out there, right? And and you can get, and, and all the, an audience can just be simply some, you know, a specific behavior. They, you know, they may, you know, look on a surf on a certain site. They may actually, you know, uh, fill out a form, whatever. There's all these behaviors out there, and each one of those is a it's a signal, right? So, what are all the possible signals? And each signal represents an audience per se, right? So, uh, so you start by identifying all of those out there, and uh, and you know, so they may be motivations, context, need states, whatever, and uh, and and you can you know you can get a lot out of there. You know, like our all the one that all we could talk about if you want to is that we had like 1,700 
possible audiences that we had. Mm -hmm. and that was our starting place, right? Wow. And then you then you say, okay, now we've got a bunch of them. Now let's think about all the possible messages that we have, right? What can we say? All within a brand construct of like, this is the brand, but imagine like having a really long tail of potential support points that can motivate mm -hmm. someone. And if you get all of those out on the table, so the same example, we had, you know, we had 120 different messages out there. Mm -hmm. But if you're gonna make 120 banner ads, it's not that hard, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so it's so all right. Let's let's put all of those messages. Then you throw them all into the marketplace. You know, we use mm -hmm. uh, you can use social media. We we sometimes would often use programmatic media because you can see mm -hmm. the full uh, loop of data. So it allows you to do a bit more, and that's why we kind of play with with uh, you know with display me with display ads, but. Um, but if you can get someone to react to those, that, then that that's basically your hand hand uh, your hand raiser moment. If you can get folks to uh, to get to your website, right? So um, uh, my goal is to get these people to their website, uh, and if, and if once you get them there, you kind of know what they reacted to and what happened, and then you've got all these hand raisers, right? Um, so once you've got done that and you've tested all these audiences, and you and you sort of figure out what all right, go back. What was that audience then was interested in this message? All right, there's something interesting. Can we see, can we see a, a pattern there? And that's where you do a lot of data science and figure out all the all the ways yeah. that this thing is really working. And then you get all the possible combinations of audiences and messages. And then you're then you've got you know you're starting at a really interesting spot. So, so is this something that you guys have done by using a bunch of ex, you know experts on labor, or are there like you know, technology ad platforms that you you're leveraging that you know let's say other people who are maybe watching now can 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 go and like tap into some of these tools. Um, yeah. You know, I, I to, to dynamically generate ads, dynamically generate copywriting. I mean, I know there's been some things mm -hmm. out there. In fact, some of those include clients of ours. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the first time we did it, we did it all basically by hand because we were trying to figure it out. And kind of, you know, when you're in there figuring it out, it kind of helps to really have your hands dirty with it. But, uh, but yeah, but now you do it with, with DCO, with dynamic creative optimization platforms, you know, like a flash talking or something. And there's a bunch of those out there. Um, and those, you, those you load in, you know, we take all the messages, you can load them all in, take all the imagery, load it all in, and then you can dynamically generate those ads. Um, mm -hmm. And then you've got to think about on the flip side is, all right, now you got that ad, where do you land them? And how do you land them on that same message? And the world of DCO is kind of broken between advertising and landing pages right now you have to kind of figure those out separately and then have the have the two married but but yeah that now you can do it a lot more with technology um versus do it all by hand i have to ask what what caused you to even stop and, and kind of question the status quo of what want, wanted you to start implementing that for the record i've daydreamed about things like this um but i find the the, the concept of implementing it very is very intimidating you know, and I think it's, mm -hmm. it, and it kind of freaks most people out. But, you know, beyond that, I'd love to know how you even got to this place of, of kind of wanting to break the rules. And I love it for the record. So, you know, <laughs> go, go, yeah. go, go, man. <laughs> I, I, they, you know, it's, same, it's the usual you know, necessity is, you know, the mother invention who said that Plato, I don't know. So, so it, okay. it's that world, right? So it's, yeah. uh, uh, you know, you kind of in a situation and we, you know, I, I, we were working, I was working with a client of mine who, came from Unilever and Pepsi and we'd worked in both those places together and you know we had plenty of money money wasn't the issue and then he got this big job as a CEO of this you know smaller company called Waleda it's like a natural skincare company and uh, his name's Rob Keen um, and uh, and Rob was saying you know you know that we're going to work together again but it's a totally different budget situation we're like we're tiny we're, no one knows who we are and you know we're up against J and J spending a hundred million dollars in marketing mm -hmm. on a email. So, um, yeah, so what yeah, do we? Yeah, had, had classic had to get you know, work smarter, not harder, because uh, yes. you know you couldn't. There's no way to compete unless you innovate it. That's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I, I, look, it, it wouldn't be oh ship if I didn't ask this question. But did you have any oh ship moments along the way? Well, I mean, the first thing was, I mean, I guess the the biggest oh ship was, you know, is like, well, getting convincing them to do something different, right? And I think there was a little bit of, there was a lot of trust because we'd worked together before, but it, the first step was like, no, 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 this is what I, let's start here. We're going to start with a segmentation study, you know, traditional research, need to get our bearings and that, yeah, you, I'm, I'm not, I mean, that's all, that was all good, but you know, that took time and, and, and money and, and, but we did that. We started with a traditional segmentation study, 
you know, research, online research, you know, it was like, you know, mm -hmm. 2,000, 2,700 people. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, we got, did the whole segment. We had a segment that was the fearless, fit and fun woman. You know, we had her all, the whole archetype, we had her named and had a perfect picture and description of our audience. And mm -hmm. she was 18% of the, of the opportunity and 12% of the marketplace. And, and uh, so she had upside in what in what we can do. We knew exactly who she was. There was a shrine in the conference room. And there was like we had the whole thing kind of worked out, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, great. Now we've got our target audience. You know, we spent six figures on this research study. It took like six months, and you know, quali quantitative, qualitative, all this stuff. And they said, okay. It's like I was like, now we, we got it, right? And we're like, great. I was, and so I said to them, I said, Rob, we've got a we've got a we've got a really good hypothesis now. Let's go test mm -hmm. it for real. He's mm -hmm. like. All right, let's go. <laughs> so we so with that, that's when we said, all right, now let's figure out how to do it in market and how do we actually, you know, so his challenge was, all right, I want you to find the, you know, her name was Sarah, find Sarah in the marketplace. And we had Sarah, we Sarah, Sarah like, with the shrine. I love this video. I have this video exactly. of the, <laughs> the Sarah with the poster and the, the all the candles yeah. around her in your conference room for some reason. <laughs> all the things that she likes to do were with her. And, you know, it was great. So, um, uh, but we, when we built the, the research, we actually knew that we were going to do this as a next step. So we kind of built all this stuff into the questionnaire that allow us to connect the behaviors online. So, it, so we knew that we'd be able to find her. But the trick was we didn't want to just find her. We wanted to find all the all the different, you know, people out there that could buy it. So what we did is then we that's when we tested it. We said, okay, great. That's when we had these 1,700 audiences we put in the marketplace and 120 ads and we threw it all out there. And uh, and what happened is we ended up with, uh, you know, and then you got to see which ones work, right? We ended up with, mm -hmm. with 575 performing audiences. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that became our target audience is 575 target audiences, right? So we have a lot of them. And, uh, and those were how many were performing uh, positively. That meaning they, they had an ROI positive. They had a, you know, a, a, you know, we can we can get more money out of them than we would spend to acquire them. So a positive CAC, and uh, and and better than their their lifetime value. Um, so so that was it. And then we then we ranked them all. And then we saw here's where Sarah, the fearless, fit, and fun woman, sat on, sat on the ranking. There was all these other audiences above her. And we said, well, you see, Rob, if you only targeted Sarah, you would you would be leaving all those more valuable audiences off to the side and we wouldn't get any of that revenue. And uh, so then the question is, all right, now how the heck do we go out there and and uh, and target them all? And that's when we, yeah. and, and build audiences. And that's when we started parsing and say, okay, there's some audiences that are more valuable, uh, certainly. So the ones at the top were like, you know, there was a woman who's really into like uh, yoga, another one that was into like astrology and and mm -hmm. figured out where the moon cycles were and all this stuff. <laughs> There's all these audiences. That <laughs> sounds like, like sounds like my wife. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she's yeah, she's got to check check the cabinets upstairs in the bathroom. She's probably got some of this stuff. So um, uh, but but that's when we were like, are these different? So those audiences, we said, okay, we're going to spend more time on those audiences. Mm -hmm. We're going to go in, we're going to find influencers, and we're going to do a shoot, and we're going to bring those influencers in, and we're going to shoot them, and we're going to have them do some work on our behalf and and we and all the content was created around those top audiences. All the ones that ranked at the top, those are the ones we spent the human labor. But then all these other ones were, you know, where we knew exactly what we needed to say to get them into the site. And that's all we needed to do because they were they were they were happy to do it. And so we kind of align the resources to the opportunity, but you're still targeting if you're targeting 575 audience, think about that. We got 575 revenue streams. So every one of those are revenue streams. So. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's really interesting stuff. And you, you said something earlier that, that I want to go back to. You were talking about just getting clients to try and do something different. Um, and, you know, as we sit here and, and talk about this, I can't help but, you know, start thinking about other times, some directly with you and I, others where you're just looking at kind of big industry trends where things started to get blown up and, um, you started to see some big fundamental shifts in, in advertising. Obviously, um, you know, what you're talking about, uh, we're starting to see some of these trends, uh, again, with companies like Prasado, who, you know, does uh, does this kind of dynamic ad generation. Um, uh, I think there's, a, a, you know, an opportunity to uh, see this really become the mainstream. But if I look back in time, uh, once I can think, keep thinking of it, it's like, you know, just even the shifts around where people even spend their dollars, uh, in advertising yeah. and marketing as people kind of, you know, kind of started moving to digital and that seemed like, you know, the golden rule was, you know, everything on TV and you just see them sounded crazy. And obviously that, that, that has inverted and, and, and started, um, you know, flipping for people. Uh, other big ones I can think of are um, the purchase funnel, 
you know, I think that was always kind of visualized as this very linear thing. And then again, a lot of it caused by, frankly, digital, um, you know, realizing that it was a very non-linear process. Um, but the one that stuck in my head that I wanted to mention was uh, you, you, you and I were, and me and my much lesser degree, but we were involved in a project back in the day uh, for Foot Locker called Sneakerpedia. Yeah. And so, yeah. uh, I've, you know, people, I don't, you know, back then I knew that the sneaker heads were a thing. And for those of you who aren't aware of this kind of stuff, there are diehard, diehard communities of fanatical sneaker collectors, people that are, you know, either just looking for rare editions of shoes that haven't been made anymore to, you know, collecting very specific versions. I think the most recent one that, that I've heard selling out and instantaneously was uh, Little Nas X, his Satan shoes. I don't know if you read about those. He made yeah. 666 pairs and every shoe has a, has a little drop of blood <laughs> from the people that made them. He's getting sued by, by Nike, uh, for Nike for making them. Uh, but anyway, there's these really crazy people about sneakers out there. And so, um, we, you know, Secret Nitro had convinced Foot Locker to put out a site called Sneakerpedia. It was like the Wikipedia of, of shoes and, and specifically for sneaker heads. But they thought about it like an ad campaign. And when it had, when the budget had gone away for one year, they said, well, that was our, that was an, that was an ad campaign. And they just turned it off. Had they kept that site alive, all the work was done. All the programming was done. They literally could have put the hosting on it. It would have been the cheapest you know, highest, uh, the lowest overhead, highest ROI, in my opinion, or one of the highest ROI things, initiatives that they probably had as a company. And, you know, now we're talking 10 years later, had that still been around, I, I would guess it would probably would have been the definitive sneaker. So oh, yeah. it was incredible when it came out and it would probably still be one of the, the definitive sneaker site out there, but people couldn't wrap their head around this idea around, you know, thinking about advertising as a business or marketing as a business. It's just a rewiring of people's heads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know if you can reflect on kind of any of the, the you know, the challenges or, or even the thinking that you saw, you know, uh, Foot Locker think about that project back then, but, or if you even think there's some correlations now, like just like just another example of like, you know, how people just need to need to be ready to flip the script. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, things things shift all the time. I mean, that that was a great, uh, a wonderful, uh, you know, thing that was out there. It was kind of a one of a kind thing, and and uh, no one else had it. It was an asset, and it was would have been a very valuable asset. I think they were thinking about yeah as a campaign. All right, we put it out there. It was a fun little stunt, and it was serving that community. But they didn't want to keep it up. And the reality is, they could they didn't have to keep it up. They could have just turned it over to the community to keep yeah. it up. But then they lose control, right? Like, oh, we can't lose control. This is our brand. And, you know, so uh, and then they didn't think about the potential for monetizing it and for the data behind it and uh, and that becoming like the marketplace. So, I mean, it, it, I mean, that could have that that little bit of it could have been a huge marketplace in and of itself. Um, and uh, they could they could have sold that a lot of money if they wanted to over time. So I, uh, it was just, I can't, it was I can't help but imagine that some, some marketing exec has probably looked back and, you know, obviously not going to name any names, but may have looked back at that now and gone, maybe that would be one of their oh shit moments if I, if yes. I interviewed them now and said, you know, that I, I could have gone back in time. And, I, and if I did, I would have kept that alive because I, I yeah. you know, we didn't make a huge fuss about it then either, but had I known what I, you know, I know now, and again, hindsight's always 2020, right. uh, yeah. but you know, I would have been like, don't turn this off. Um, you know, but people, people don't, people don't get it. Um, so, so, uh, you know, just a couple more things, uh, then, so, you know, again, really enjoyed digging into this kind of challenging the status quo, but you've had a really interesting career uh, in general. And I'd like to just kind of touch on that. Uh, have you had any kind of, uh, you know, moments of triumph, uh, or, or kind of, averted disaster oh ship moments maybe that turned into moments of triumph that you know that you can share because i know you've always got some good stories tucked away and uh figured i'd give you an open mic <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's i mean there's definitely i i'd say i it's sort of like i think about it as more like what my formative moments were in my career and like why i am the way i am right now what what turned me into such a freak um <laughs> so that the, the first one was so my, you know, I kind of just, my philosophy is anything's possible. You just got to push and push and push and figure it out. You'll figure it out if you kind of have the 
if you want to make something happen, you almost have to believe it first and then figure out how to get there later. So, um, so uh, the very first, I was like 22 years old. It was 1994. My, uh, it was, this was like, I was in pure advertising, advertise my first job out of college. And, uh, I had my first big break, but it ended up, uh, being my first, so ship moment too. And, and, uh, uh, there was a, there was my there, the first time there was a you know that at that time it was before the internet this is 94 so this was like television was like the pinnacle of advertising yeah. and you know you can have a tv shoot on your resume you know that that's how you get started so um but the uh, so we had this tv shoot and it was uh uh and my boss at the time who was supposed to cover this shoot usually you would you know this is like something it, when you're like five ten years in the business you can cover a shoot and, uh, you know, my boss at the time, like a week before the shoot quits. And so the, uh, so the, the my, the, her boss, you know, basically said, you know, well, you know, Lance, you know, say we're, her boss was busy. She couldn't do it. She's running lots of other stuff. And she's like, do you, do you think you can cover the shoot? I'm like, yeah, why not? You know, I was 22 years old. I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Just tell me what I got to do. <laughs> so they, uh, so they say, all right, so it's a big shoot. You know, we're spending, you know, it was like, you know, four to five hundred thousand dollars for the shoot, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I had to go out there and, you know, I had, to, I had to make sure the client was happy, make sure that we got what we said we were going to get and manage the creatives and production crew and all that stuff. So I get on the I go out there that the creative team's already out there doing some pre pre prep and uh, I get I go out like 48 hours before the shoot is supposed to go off and the client's supposed to come the next day on my way over on the flight the LA, the huge LA earthquake happened. It was like a 6.7 on the Richter scale. It was like the whole, the city was basically demolished. I didn't even know they would be can land. Uh, you know, like the highways were falling down, buildings were crumbling, the infrastructure's gone. And I get there and, that, and I land to this. And you know, we circled for like an hour to see if, we, if it was even possible to land. They got to send me back. And uh, so we, I eventually, we, they eventually landed us. And, you know, there was, I, I had to figure out how to, act that, you know, I don't remember if there were cell phones back then. There must have been. But the, it was like, <laughs> I got to figure out how to get out of there. And so I called a friend up and he, he picked me up at the airport, you know, trying to navigate like local roads because you couldn't go on highways because they were all collapsed. And, uh, and I finally get to the hotel and there the uh, there there's the producer and then they had what's called like a cost consultant back then who's like the client, you know, the person right. who kind of deals with the business side of the shoot and uh, represents the client. So they're talking, they're like, I get there and they're like, okay, we're going to cancel the shoot. We, you know, we have some insurance, but it's going to cost us, you know, $150,000 to, oh. you know, uh, but that's all we'll lose. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, and a couple of things go through my head. It was like, you know, my O ship was like, oh ship, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> And it was my first time. I'm not going to come back empty handed. I was like, yeah. I was like, no, we're not doing that. It's like, we're not, we're not going not gonna to have a shoot. I'm like, no, you don't understand. The entire city is closed. No productions are happening. The, 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 uh, the locations dropped out. So we can't even shoot there anyways. And we're just going to move on. And the reality is I was thinking in my head, first of all, the ad wasn't that good. I don't want to, uh, it was, it was not a great ad, but for some crazy reason we had, this amazing director of photography on it, whose name was Alan Davio, who's Steven Spielberg's DP. And, um, and, and I was like, and you know, he, he, this is the guy who did like ET and close encounters. Yeah, and, like, he was like, going to be this guy. Yeah, kind of thing. I was like, I was like, We've got, and, and he's about to go off on his, on like a movie. So we're going to lose him if we delay it and we're going to lose all this money. And, uh, and I think it was probably the only way that this thing was going to be even remotely good, decent is if we actually got this guy, this kind of a talent to actually help us. So I said, we got it. We're going to do the shoot. I was like, I, I just refused to say <laughs> to no on it. And they're like, no, you don't understand. There's no way around it. And the client's not going to come out here. And um, so I, like, I, I'm going to get on the phone with the clients. I talked to the client who's, you know, and, and you know, it's like, I'm 22 years old. I'm like trying to convince them. I'm from San Francisco originally. So I'm trying to convince them that earthquake's no big deal, right? <laughs> the city's fallen. <laughs> it's just it's the the bus aftershocks. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Just come on out. And his wife's in the background. You're not going. And so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so somehow I convinced him to get on a plane to come out there. And I said, we've got to do this. I told him, I said, you're the brand manager of this thing. You're not going to be able to even $150,000. You're done. You're not going to make an ad for the three. It was like not a huge account. You're not going to make another ad for two or three years. Your business is going to tank. If that product you put in all the stores, they're not going to move off the shelves. You're stuck. You have to, we have to do it. I'm sure we can make it happen. I said, you get on the flight and I'll, while you're flying, I'll figure out how to get it to go. <laughs> so I'm telling, so I got the producer. I said, all right, well, so what are we going to, what if we do here? So they said, all right, we got, need a new location. So I was like, there's, there's gotta be a location that doesn't, that, that hasn't like crumbled to the ground. We'll find one. So they find one and they said, okay, now all the prop houses are closed. So I said, okay, 
uh, who's on the crew. I was like, and and uh, and and the, and the house that they found was like this really luxurious and it had to be like a middle America house. So they said, all right, get all that furniture out. We got to get new furniture, but the out prop houses are closed. So get a U-Haul. We're gonna go to all the. We're gonna pick up the furniture. No <laughs> Went to the cruise house, picked up the furniture. You're like, you're like, who has very average stuff? Because that's the <laughs> house we need to go to right the now. Definitely crew. They, they, they'll be fine. And uh, so that's so that's what we did. And we, you know, we shot between aftershocks, and we, you know, we just like, all right, wait, hold. You know, it take like five, ten minutes for an aftershock to clear out, and we're done. And we and we were the only production crew filming in Los Angeles. Down, like 48 hours after the after the uh, uh, the earthquake happened, there was literally no one else shooting in town. The only permit, so it was just sort of like there has got to be a way to do it. Um, and uh, and and if you just believe it, you'll figure it out. And it was sort of like I had a client coming over, and we're gonna get there, get there some way or another, and, and we made it happen some way. And it was it turned out okay. It was pretty good ad. Product did really well, and you know, we, but the most important thing is it actually happened. So. So that kind of awesome. set my thinking that anything could happen if you just kind of push hard enough and figure it out and and uh, just make that make the it's about solving a problem. It's not about you know do we not do it or do it. It's just like and you'll learn a lot just by figuring it out. I, I love that. I don't know how I'm going to top that. So I think that is a, a perfect a perfect way to end this week's episode. Uh, Lynn, that, that was great. I'm so glad uh, we were able to reconnect. It was ni nice to see your face. I always love catching up with you, and it's just as much fun I catching guess. up with you on, on camera with other people watching. Um, I really appreciate you sharing some of those insights. Um, you know, I'm going to put some uh, more kind of group of ship shows together this uh, this year, uh, and uh, you know, I can imagine pulling you in with some other folks uh, and doing kind of a you know challenge the status quo kind of episode. We can debate some of this stuff. Love uh, it. Love it. Um, so for those of you uh, that, uh, you know, are, whether you're watching live or you're watching uh, on YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn after the show, um, you know, this is a show that we do just, just because we love it. We love bringing in um, some of these you know, great friends I've been lucky enough to make over the years. Um, the best thing you can do to support the show is give us a like, uh, give it a thumbs up, share it on your feeds. Um, and just and just support the show in that way. Spread the good word. That's all. We, that's all we look for. We just want to know that um, you know people are enjoying the content that we're creating, and and hopefully that it's inspiring you in some way. And if nothing else, making you feel like maybe that little screw up you had last week wasn't such a big deal after all. So, uh, Lance, thanks. Thanks again for coming on our ship. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure.